it's the same thing with a horizontal asymptote. If I don't find the limit, I will not be able to identify the horizontal asymptote. Here, I identify the vertical asymptote because the function is undefined at negative 3. But I have to show the, the limits. I have to determine this part. If I don't determine that, then just saying that x equals negative 3 is a vertical asymptote doesn't mean much. So aside, I guess aside from showing your work, because I'm reading like what the question's asking is saying to show the, to find the horizontal and vertical asymptotes. That's really what we were doing was just showing our work. Yes. And we have okay. to, and the corresponding limits. Without the corresponding limits, just saying that x is a vertical asymptote, this is no calculus. I knew that from pre-calculus. I knew that from college algebra, that this function has a vertical asymptote of negative 3. But now what we learned, and we learned in this class how to determine the limits in college algebra and pre-calculus, nobody knew this. We just said, OK, it must be a vertical asymptote. And let's graph it with a calculator to find the limits. No, there is no need now, because we know how to find the limits. I think the confusion is that the question doesn't actually ask for those. Which, again, that's we going through it. Um, number 47 doesn't ask for the corresponding limits. But I, I will always ask. Because okay. this is college algebra and pre-calculus. Anyone can identify this by looking at the domain. But this is what we studied in this class. They go together now. This is the explanation why this is a vertical asymptote. Before, we didn't know why. We just said, oh, it's undefined. It must be a vertical asymptote. But now we know the explanation why. This is what we learned in this class. So are you saying the infinity and the negative infinity represents the corresponding limits? Yes. These are the corresponding limits to the vertical asymptote. From the left-hand side, it goes to positive infinity. From the right-hand side, it goes to, goes to negative infinity. These limits are corresponding to the vertical asymptote x equals negative 3. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, I just wanted to know what, like, what you wanted us to, to put when you're asking for that. Yes, so one more time. This, everyone knew from college algebra. But why? Why does this happen? Because of this. Because of these limits. We didn't know that before this class. Everyone knew, OK, well, it's undefined. It must be a vertical asymptote. No. It's a vertical asymptote because the limits are these. That's the definition of a vertical asymptote. It's because the limits are infinity. Because if this is 5 and this is 3, this is not a vertical asymptote. It is a vertical asymptote because of this reason. In the past, we couldn't present that in college algebra and pre-calculus. Although, they're trying to add that in a little bit with some graphs. But now we do. This is the supportive uh, reason for this, which we did not know because we did not know this limit operator before. So that's why it makes no sense. This, everyone can determine. I can punch it in the graph in Calgary, and I'll tell you it's a vertical asymptote. No, it is a vertical asymptote because these limits are the way that they are. Either both sides positive infinity, both sides negative infinity, or one or the other. That's the reason for this. But we couldn't say that, and then we couldn't show that before. Very good questions. Thank you. I really appreciate that. OK, the last two sections of chapter 8, I always present them together. So 2.7 and 2.8. Before we uh, discuss this, uh, before we go into what it is all about, uh, this is what we built. We built everything just to get here so far. So 2.1 through 2.6 are the basis of this, 2.7 and 2.8. Where we are going to look at something, I don't want to mention, mention it just that from the beginning. I just need one more second, and I will mention what it is. So now, what are the two major concepts that we studied so far? 
that you've seen over and over and over and over. Give me two concepts, huge concepts from the beginning of the class. Definition of a limit. Yes, 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 awesome. This is the biggest. Limits. That's one. And the other one that we started with from the get-go. Something that we calculated for several different functions. That's a huge topic. Difference quotient? Thank you very much. These are the major, the two major topics that we studied so far in here. We learned about limits and how we use them and why we determine what we determine. And we determine this super important concept for several functions. Okay, now in this, these two sections, we're going to put these two together. So what do I mean by putting them together? So when we put these two concepts together, like the limit and the difference quotient, of course, this age approaches zero. So when we put this concept and this concept and we make them put them together, we get something called f prime of x. What is all this? What does this mean? This is the derivative, and this is the title of these two. Derivative function. So, first of all, let's look at the concept. I'm going to look back at the, the same function we are playing with from a long time ago. So this is our um, um, f of x, x comma f of x, that's our p. Of course, this is our famous q of x plus h, f of x plus h. Nothing new so far. Of course, q is right here, right here next to p, but I am zooming in because I can't explain otherwise. So what is all this? What is the difference quotient? Is the slope of this line, of the secant line. This is the difference quotient. But now when we put the limit in front of it, remember this was x. And this is x plus h. This distance, what is the distance between x and x plus h? What is it? h. Of course. Now look here. here. So this piece is the slope of this line. But once I put the limit in front of it, and as h approaches 0, it means that q gets closer, 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 closer. Not exactly p ever, because h cannot be 0. Closer, 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 closer. What does, what happens to this line? What does it change into? Tangent line. Yes. So the derivative function gives the slope. This is the slope of the secant line. But with the limit in front of it, the slope of this line becomes the slope of this line. So the derivative function represents the rate of change at this point called the instantaneous. This is not the instantaneous. This is the average rate of change between two points. But now this one, the derivative function, gives the rate of change the instantaneous rate of change of a function at any point where, and there is a keyword there. Let me write this down first, and then I'll represent the keyword. So this is the derivative function that represents, equals, the instantaneous rate of change of f of x at any point where, and this is a very important concept, where f of x is, big word,
where the function is differentiable. What does this mean? Where its derivative exists. OK, let's talk about it for a moment. When I put these two concepts together, this concept just gives the slope between PQ, the slope of the, ten, of the secant line PQ. But when I add the limit to this, it means that this age gets closer and closer, closer and closer, closer and closer to 0, which means that now I'm interested in the slope of the tangent line. So when I say the instantaneous rate of change at this point, I also say the slope of the tangent line at this point. They are all the same. The instantaneous rate of change or the slope of the tangent line at this point. In other words, remember, I drive to New York. You asked me what was your average speed for the duration of driving, not for taking a bathroom break or lunch break. And I can determine that. I will find, I will find the distance. I will divide by the time and tell you my average rate. But if you ask me, you're driving? Yes. What is your speed at that moment? I have to look at the odometer. I can't tell you. But if we have the, dis the uh, distance function and we differentiate it, then I will be able to give you the slope of the, sec of the tangent line at that point the instantaneous rate of change, the instantaneous velocity, or the slope of the tangent line. So the instantaneous rate of change at any point where f of x is differentiable, it has derivative. And now wait a minute. When does a function not have a derivative? When or where? When f of x is not differentiable. When the slope is just a number. We want the slope to be a number. So in the oh, we're like we're like it's a constant function. That also like, has a rate like, of change, which is zero. Yeah. If I have ten dollars in my pocket, what is the rate of change if I don't put and I don't spend? Zero. So where is this function a function not differentiable? Number one. When it's not continuous. How come? Well, the function is differentiable if it has a unique just one tangent. It doesn't have a unique tangent at this point. This is the tangent on this side, and this is the tangent on this side. So if the function is not continuous, the function is not differentiable. It does not have a unique tangent, no unique tangent, two tangents. Here is another situation. Let me see the time here. OK, I'm OK. So here's another situation. Cusp or corner. Not differentiable. OK, so there is a tangent here and a tangent here. Or it can be considered like a vertical tangent depending on what's going on here. There is a tangent on this side, and there is a tangent on this side. And no, if you say tangent here, no, 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 no. The tangent has to follow the function. Follow the function. Follow the function. This is not the case. You cannot draw a tangent here. OK? You have to follow the function. So when I follow the function, tangent. Follow the function, tangent. So these are two tangents. One that has a negative slope, the other one is the positive slope at this corner. At this corner, everywhere else is differentiable, but not at this corner. Everywhere else is differentiable, but not at this, at the cusp. So number one, not continuous. Number two, cusp or corner. And there is one more in which we have a function something like this, where it has a vertical tangent, because the slope is undefined. Here I have two slopes. Here I have an undefined slope, which means 
this, this answer is infinity, which means f prime does not exist because the limit exists only if it's a number. If it's not a number, this is not, this does not exist. So this is vertical tangent. So in these situations, the function f of x is not differentiable, so not continuous, cos per corner, or vertical tangent. This function does not exist because the limit does not exist. So if this function doesn't exist, this function is not differentiable. And I prepared because I already have this here. I thought I would, um, it would, um, I was hoping that this would be a little bit bigger. I don't know if, can you see it? Is there any way you can see it? Well, let me, let me do this. Is this better now? Yes. So this is function g of x. Uh, let me see how do I call this. I call page 12. Um, and we are asked 0, g prime of negative 2, g prime of 0, g prime of 2, and g prime of 4. OK. So we are asked to put these in the ascending order. Arrange them, these numbers in ascending, I can, I can write ascending order. Okay, so we want to 